Now, this morning, we're going to, how many of you got your, your, uh, your fill-ins? Let me see them. Wave at me. Let me see them. If you don't have a fill-in, you are missing out. Pastor, why do we fill in these things? Number one, it helps you fall asleep a lot less easy. Number two, it helps you remember what we're talking about because you're seven times more likely to remember what you write down. When we were at youth camp, the speaker kept saying, make sure you take notes because everyone knows that only people that take notes go to heaven. I don't know if that's biblically biblically true, but it sounds good. So make sure you take some notes this morning because this morning we're going to close out the big idea, 10 to life. We've been talking about the Ten Commandments and how they're meant by God to liberate us and not to enslave us. And this morning, I want to get us caught up. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. If you don't have your Bibles, you can read the screen behind me. But follow along with me. And it says this, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no, everybody say no, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Let's time out right there. We started off this big idea with the first two commandments. Have no other gods before me and make and worship no other idols. Now, but don't put that on the screen yet. I want you to fill that in if you know what this, this next point is. Commandments 1 and 2 is all about God as our what? Write it down. Priority. Very good. Wow. Some of you are paying attention. It's all about God as our priority. It's all about putting God first, that if we will recognize that the Ten Commandments are not to enslave us, but they exist in order to liberate us, and we are liberated by having our priorities in check. How many of you have ever gotten your priorities out of balance? Anybody? Okay, about half of you. The other half are lying, which was what we're going to deal with today. So we've all gotten our priorities out of check, and what happens when your priorities get out of check? You get overwhelmed. Life gets unbalanced. You get stressed. You get anxiety. Life just does not work out the way it is intended to work out. So God says, listen, let me help set the standard up front that I am your priority. And then we pick up in verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Commandments 3 and 4, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So let me ask you a question. How many of you remember this feeling? Commandments 3 and 4 are all about living what? Living healthy. Very good. Man, I am I am so proud as a pastor right now that y'all remembered that. Aw. Living healthy. Commandments 3 and 4 is God's way of saying, listen, I want you to be healthy, not just physically, but also emotionally and also spiritually. I was talking to a a wise man this week. He was investing in my life, and he was talking about the reality that most of us are emotionally unhealthy. Most of us in this room right now are emotionally unhealthy. Most Americans, most people in the world, because we don't take time to worry about our emotions. Men, we hate our emotions. We try to kill them. Women, we don't know what our emotions are going to look like from day to day, so we just go with the flow, and and it's just a mess. But God says, listen, I care about your emotions. Let me help you get your emotions in check. I want you to be healthy by taking a break, by not putting more things on your plate than than need to be on your plate. Let's let's keep things focused. My gosh, that's a lot of rain that just started. Let's all just take a moment and look, get it out of our system. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I will preach until it stops raining, just so you don't have to get wet, okay? Let's pick up in verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. Commandments 5 and 6 are all about honoring your parents, both under the covering and outside of the covering. It's all about taking that time to honor them and honor them correctly. And then number 6, don't kill nobody. Amen? Amen. That's a good time to say amen when the preacher's asking you if you're planning on killing somebody. Say, so, okay, we're not killing nobody, right? Amen? Okay, good. 
Commandments 5 and 6, they're all about something particular. What are they about? Respect. I feel like some of you have your notes from last week and you're cheating, but that's okay because it still makes me feel good you remember. Okay? Commandments 5 and 6 are all about respect and respecting your parents and respecting the, the lives of those around you. Not Obviously, we're not killers in this room, murderers, but respecting the quality of life, respecting the value of life, and not devaluing people around us. Then last week, we jumped into verse 14, you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal. I was amazed last week, we had more guests last week than we have in the past year, and we have all these new people show up on a Sunday morning. Maybe you didn't notice, both services had just a ton of guests. We have a huge stack of cards uh, to follow up with people, and I'm sitting there going, of all days to visit the church when we're talking about adultery. Fantastic. But what an awesome day it was as God changed lives last week. Last week we talked about adultery and what it, what it means to take something you did not earn. We talked about, we talked about uh, stealing and what it means to not take things that you did not earn. That there is something about, about the way God designed things that you were meant to have the things that you earn. Not that he doesn't just bless you with things, but we're not meant to take things that are not ours. Commandments 7 and 8 are all about honor. That we are to honor the things that God has given us and to honor the things that we have earned to be good stewards of it. And today we pick up in verse 16. It says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that is your neighbor's. Today we're going to unpack this idea about lying and coveting. Sounds fun, right? What a day to come to church. We're talking about lying and coveting. Just remember, though, the Ten Commandments are meant to liberate, not to enslave. They're meant to give us some basic structure to live by. So let's start out. Let's talk a little bit about lying. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The word neighbor here literally means brother, companion, fellow, friend. It also means it also means husband, lover, neighbor, and just anybody else that doesn't fit in one of those categories. Neighbor does not just literally mean the person next door to your house. It literally means everybody. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, hi, neighbor. Hi. Oh, Tammy. Hi, neighbor. Hi, neighbor, Tammy. Hi, neighbor. Don't want you be my neighbor. <laughs> How can you not love Mr. Rogers? I mean... Any man that changes his shoes on the on TV and wears a, a little jacket is just cute as a button. Isn't it funny how throughout life we begin to look at lies in a justifiable way? I want you to do another thing for me because we're about to have a breakthrough right here. On a Sunday morning at 934, I want you to look your neighbor in the eyes. If you don't know him, it's okay. Just look him in the eyes and say, you are a liar. And then palm slap him. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that part. Friends, we've all lied, haven't we? We've all told stories, white lies, black lies, green lies. It doesn't matter. We've all lied. And friends, let me tell you something. Lying is not justifiable. There is only one lie in all of creation that is justifiable. Not one, not just one, only one. There's only one lie you can ever tell. Honey, does this make me look fat? Lie! (laughs) I'll never forget it. We were young. I was dumb. I still am dumb. But I was young and dumb. And uh, newly married. And my wife says, does this make my butt look fat? And I said, no, your butt makes your butt look fat. I know. That was stupid. I got this thing about not lying. Don't ask me what you think unless you want to know the truth. Pastor, does this toupee look good? No. Pastor, how does this look on me? Not good. Don't ask me if you don't want to know. That's the rule in our. Don't ask if you don't want to know. But yet we still justify even those kind of lies, don't we? Honey, do I look fat in that? No. You're beautiful. Don't hurt me. I'm just kidding. You know, this verse is more than just about telling a lie. It's, it has a lot more to do than, than just lying to people about their looks or lying to people about your job or lying to the police officer about where you really were last night. It has a lot more to do about, about than just telling lies. It has a lot to do about being a false witness. 
Let me, let me kind of give you some backstory. See, during biblical times, let's, let's rewind a little bit. They had a little bit of a different structure than we do now. See, nowadays, if, if you're called into court, say, for murder, well, they're going to run DNA tests. They're going to run fingerprinting. They're going to look for witnesses. They're going to look for video. They're going to look in your computer. They're going to find out where you've been. They're going to look at all this different stuff and make a decision. Friends, I want to enlighten you this morning with some truths about history. They did not have DNA testing back then. Are you all with me this morning? Moses did not have a little brush with dust on it to check fingerprints. So back then they had a different system for finding out the truth. They used the principle of two witnesses. See, it required two individuals speaking the same thing against an individual in order to convict him. It took two people coming together and saying, I know he did it. I saw him do it. It would be like if Pastor Jacob was doing absolutely nothing wrong, but I came in and I said, well, I saw Pastor Jacob shimmy up that tree and he stole a coconut. I don't know where that came from, but let's just go with it. You know, it means nothing. He's not going to get in trouble for that, but if... Brother Larry comes in and goes, well, I saw him shimmy up that same tree, and I saw him take that coconut. Now we have two witnesses, and it doesn't matter what he says or anybody else says, there are now two individuals to condemn him for shimmying up that coconut tree and stealing a coconut. All it took was two witnesses. So this is the principle, this is the, the legal system that they had at that time to convict people of, of wrongdoing. And we see the same thing happen in the New Testament where, where they bring Jesus up on charges and he's looking, they're looking for witnesses to say, did he do it or did he not do it? And he had people that came in and bore false witness and said, yes, I've heard him blasphemy. Yes, I've heard him break the law. Yes, he, is, he has broke the law of Moses. And he had these false witnesses come in and convict him. See, the problem is if those individuals are lying or bearing a false witness, then that individual is convicted regardless of the truth. See, a, a false witness supersedes and erases the truth many times. And bearing false witness, it's about creating a false perception. Did you hear me this morning? Be being a false witness means to create a false perception about something or someone. But there's a problem. When we start lying and bearing false witness and creating false perceptions about other people, something happens. First of all, lies proliferate. Now, you may not know what that means, so let me help you this morning. Proliferate means to multiply rapidly. I don't know if you've ever lied, but I know that you have, and you're in denial. So I'll just use me as an example. I, I've been caught in a lie before. I remember when I was younger, I, I went through this stage, and I, don't, I lost my mind. And I became this, just this crazy liar about everything. I was, I was in grade school, and I would lie about my grades, and I would create these elaborate stories. And when my parents began to get close to the truth, I would create more stories and more lies to protect that. And then when they got close to that lie, I would create more lies and more deceit in order to create a false witness, a false perception of who I was and what I was really doing in school. See, lies proliferate. You don't just tell one lie. You have to continue to tell lies and lie after lie after lie. Even little lies are still big lies. Lies grow quickly. They proliferate. Lies are destructive. See, if truth sets people free, then lies create bondage and destruction. Lies set people up for a fall. Lies create a false perception that destroys and hurts people. And there's no better illustration than this than American Idol. How many of you have seen American Idol? Okay, how many of you have seen the episode where those kids get on stage or those young adults get on stage and you're going, ooh, ooh. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy, like y'all don't watch TV. How many of you have seen the episode where the, they have no talent? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. I had a kid in my youth group that went on American Idol. He went to go try out. And I remember him telling us, hey, Pastor, I'm going to go try out. And I remember looking at him and being that I don't beat around the bush, I said, why? And he said, because I have a gift of singing. And I remember going, no, you don't. And he said, my mama said I can sing. Let me tell you what I've noticed about American Idol. Somewhere in the lines, before those goofballs got on stage and started singing, somewhere down the line was a mama that was lying to them, telling them that they were good. And then they get on American TV, American Idol, and we're watching going, ooh, Jesus, take the wheel. Right? 
Somewhere down that line, some mama was going, oh, you're so good, honey. Just sing your heart out. It's all about your heart. They'll see beyond the notes. It's about your heart. Bull, you sound bad. Don't get on TV. They put your name under there. Don't do that. It happens every day. We're, we lie and we create a false perception that people in our lives are better than they, what they are. Or they, they have a strength in an area that they don't have a strength. And people get set up for failure and destructive things because they have been lied to, both good ways and bad ways. I've also seen young people that in high school or in elementary school had teachers that told them that they're not smart enough, that they'll never be good enough. And I remember as they grew and as I became their youth pastor back then, I remember looking at them going, you have such a low self-identity. Why? Because somebody lied to me and said that I was never going to be good enough. Friends, lies can be destructive. They can tear people down. Number three, lies are rooted in evil. If you're with me this morning, say amen. Lies are rooted in evil. Creating a self-deception, a self-false perception is truly rooted in evil. See, in John 8, it says, this is Jesus talking. It says, you are the father. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. Say character. For he is a liar and the father of all lies. Could you imagine Jesus looking at you and going, your daddy's the devil? That's kind of a slap in the face, isn't it? And he begins to elaborate that the, the, the very character and the very nature of Satan is that he is a liar at his very core because lies are rooted out of a core character issue. If you have a problem with creating a self-deception and a self-perception of people, you've got to understand that that is all rooted out of a character issue. It's really easy to look beyond that, that commandment and go, Pastor, I'm not a... I'm not a pathological liar. I'm not creating these, these crazy, crazy stories. I had someone in my family that uh, suffered from somewhat of a, a mental disorder, and she was a pathological liar, a diagnosed pathological liar. And she would meet people, and she would create these elaborate stories of who she was and where she came from and what her life was all about. And I remember looking at her like, you've done lost your mind. And it's easy to look and go, well, that's what liars are all about. But the reality is all of us are liars in some form or some way. It may not be a bold-faced lie that we tell someone, but it could be creating a, a false perception or a deception of what's really happening in a circumstance or what needs to happen because it's easier to protect people by creating a false reality. Let me switch gears a little bit this morning. See, the next and the last commandment is the one that kind of wraps everything all up. We're doing two commandments at a time because each two have something very special in common. And this, the last commandment, commandment number 10, wraps everything up. It's all about coveting. We go from lying to coveting. And I want, I want to explain to you what that means here in just a moment, but let's look at Scripture. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, it says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is in your neighbor's or that is your neighbor's. Whew, Pastor, I'm in the clear. I have never wanted someone else's servant. I've never looked at someone and be like, hey, I like that slave you got. Can I borrow them? I've never coveted somebody's ox. I've never just overly wanted someone else's donkey. I've never looked at someone's donkey and go, I want to ride that donkey. Ride that donkey, hey. Little pop culture reference. I didn't do the dance, though. So if I haven't wanted your donkey, and I haven't wanted your ox, and I haven't wanted your male servants, and I haven't wanted your female servants, then I must be in the clear because this doesn't apply to me. Now listen to me. It's always the first and the last thing that we should always pay attention to in every area because you always lead in with the most important, and you always sum up at the end. Are you all with me this morning? So the first and the last of everything is very important. When you look at Jesus' life, looking at the first thing he did and the last thing he did are important. Looking at the first thing he said versus the last thing he said is always very important. 
Our kids just went away for a week to spend time with grandma. Thank you, Jesus. And, and when they left, the first thing we tell them is, is, is what's important. The last thing we tell them sums everything else up. The Ten Commandments are no different. So let me bring it in a way that kind of makes sense to us, especially when we're talking about the little things it says not to covet. See, coveting is, is a very powerful thing. And the first thing that we tend to covet is status. That's what male and female servants are all about. See, in in that culture, you had male and female servants once you had the money to purchase them. Once you had established yourself in the clan, in the community enough that you could earn a male servant or a female servant, that you could provide for their needs. See, it wasn't like, like we see in our history books when it talks about slavery. A male servant and a female servant were taken care of very well. They were taken care of in every way possible. They had all their needs met, but you could only meet their needs once you had your needs. Met. So when it's talking about your male and female servants, what it's saying is don't covet somebody else's status. I don't know if, about you, but I've been at a place before in my life where I look at someone and I go, boy, I wish I could be where they're at in life. I wish I could have the things that they have. I wish that I could have success like that person has had success. Come on. I hope I'm not the only one. Maybe you've looked or watched a TV show and and you look at someone else's life and you go, wow, I wish I could obtain that kind of status. I wish I could reach that kind of status and have that kind of stuff. I, I want to be known. I want to be recognized. I want people to know who I am. I want people to recognize who I am when I walk into a place. I want to have people's respect because I've attained status. Number two, coveting opportunities. When we covet, many times we covet opportunities. How do you figure, Pastor? Well, that's what the ox is all about. See, in in, in biblical times, the ox represented livelihood. You needed an ox in order to till your ground. They didn't have them big John Deere tractors back then. There weren't Kabodos running around planting crops. They had an ox. And they would yoke them together, and they would take a blade, and they would shove it in the ground, and they would, they would allow those ox to drag the land, and they would till the land up using the ox. See, the ox is a way of livelihood. It's looking at somebody and going, well, if I had only had their opportunities. If somebody had given me the kind of opportunities they've given them, maybe I would be at a better place. It's not fair that they they were able to go to college and have it all paid for. It's not fair that they were given a great job opportunity. It's not fair that they, they found someone smart and beautiful and handsome to spend the rest of their life with. It's not fair. I wanted that opportunity. I wish that I could have been given that opportunity. Come on, God, why would you give them that and not me? Coveting is looking at someone else's job and saying, I wish I had their job. I wish I had their career. I wish I could do what they're doing. Come on, we've all done it. We've all fought it. Maybe you've been at a place in life. Maybe you've had a friend where you look at their job and you look at their livelihood and you look at what what things God has blessed them with and you've coveted their opportunities. Number three. You all still with me? Say amen. All right. Number three. Coveting rewards. In this verse of scripture, it uses the word donkey. God's saying, hey, don't covet your neighbor's donkey. Now, I know we live in the mule capital of the world, and there's probably some of you that sit in that mule parade, and you've lost your mind, and you see them mules come by, and you covet those mules. But can I just be honest with you? There's not even a little part of me that looks at a mule and goes, hmm, I want one of them. Anybody else like that, or is it just me? Okay, a few of you. I didn't expect to feel those emotions when I moved to the mule capital of the world. What is that? But I, I do recognize that I feel those emotions. I don't, I don't long for someone else's donkey, but there are times that I long for someone else's reward. See, a donkey was a reward. It was something that, again, someone had earned. It was something that they had obtained. It was something they had built up. See, in that time and day, a donkey was like a car. You ever coveted someone else's car? If you're a man, you better say amen. Come on now. You've seen that car drive by and go, hmm, Jesus. We were driving on this week, a little workation my wife and I took, and a brand new Corvette Stingray drove by. Now, it drove by very fast, so I didn't have a long time to covet, but I did have enough time. Mm. 
know, the reality is that every one of us at some point or another have coveted someone else's reward, something that they've obtained in their life. My wife has a statement she shares with me often. It's a, and it's a powerful statement. Don't judge your present based off someone else's experiences. When you look at someone and maybe they're at a different place in life, maybe they've worked longer than you have. Maybe they're retired. See, there's times that I get jealous of the retired people. Pastor Jacob says he wishes he could go to the primetime luncheons. Let me tell you, it's bad for you. Because when you sit around and you, you get to talk to people that have lived their life and now they're being able to live out some of their dreams and they're, they're not having to go to work every day and they're not having to deal with all kinds of difficult people and they're just loving life, hanging out with their spouse or whatever they're doing. And I just kind of look at that and go, ooh, I want that. I, I'm not going to lie to you. Every time I hear about the Heidels jumping in their RV and taking off somewhere, I covet. I mean, I'm, they're sinful. I'm not going to lie to you. Oh, take me. Come on, somebody. You, you, you want what someone else has obtained, a reward for faithfulness, a reward for working hard. There's times in our lives we long for what others have earned. And it's easy to argue that almost all sin roots not f- following this commandment. All, I'm sorry, let me say that again. It's easy to argue that almost all sin roots right here. Everything comes back to this. Since the fall of man... Even before the fall of man, as as the Bible teaches us that that Satan was in the throne room of heaven and he would stand in front of the glory of God and the light would shine through him, and that's a message in itself, he began to get prideful and arrogant. He began to covet. He began to think that he was better than himself and long for the worship that God was receiving. Every sin roots back to coveting. And since the fall of man, all of us at our very core feel drawn to things that are evil. Every single one of you at the sound of my voice are naturally drawn to things that are evil. Well, pastor, I'm not out there doing witchcraft and I'm not out doing like crazy stuff. It doesn't matter. Listen to me. All sin is is equal in the eyes of God because it's, it's the absence of God. So hear me when I say that all of us here are drawn to evil things. We are naturally drawn to do things that we shouldn't do. Even Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. Even Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, one of the, very, one of the greatest leaders in, in, in the Christian movement, says, I am the chief of all sinners. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing, and the things that I, I want to do, I don't end up doing. And there's this conflict in myself because I'm naturally drawn to things that are evil. See, the Hebrew word covet is hamad. It translates into the Greek word epithyma. Are you all with me? See, in all this translation, the the word covet actually translates into desire and lust. In fact, we see this word used again in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Listen to me. This, This brings it together this morning. It says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires, covet, the things that you covet of the flesh. For the desires, there's the word again, of the flesh or against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these two are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Even in the New Testament, we see this word coveting things that others have. And the word flesh in this scripture, it translates to human nature, that we naturally covet other things. It's usually that thing that feels natural to us. I need you to hear me this morning. If you haven't heard anything else, please listen. I'm always extremely leery when someone justifies something by saying it just feels right. Did you hear that? There's people here this morning that you're doing things and you've allowed things into your lifestyle that you would say it just feels right. It doesn't feel wrong. Friends, your feelings will lie to you. Your feelings will lead you astray. Your feelings are the flesh. It's that which comes natural. And that what comes natural is for us to covet and long for other things, desires that weren't given by God. This morning, I'm closing here in just a moment. I want, I, want, I want to get personal, though. I want to get real personal with you this morning. I want you to answer a question, not out loud, because I'm not here to, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to deal with your mess. That's, that's between you and God. But I do want you to make it personal. In your fill-ins this morning is a blank. It says, the desire for blank has filled my mind this week. Let's put some feet on this concept. What is some desire, some fleshly desire that has filled your mind this week? 
What is something that you have coveted and longed for that wasn't given by God? What is something that has robbed your thoughts? What is something that you've desired for? What has filled your mind this week? I want you to write it down. I want you to put some, some flesh on this. I want you to make it real. Pastor, why am I doing this? Because it's so easy to walk out of the doors and not remember. To not make what happened today personal. What if we desired more of a relationship with God or to be used by God as we do the things of the flesh? How could God use us differently? A couple weeks ago at our life group, we just had just a, a moment kind of outside of uh, what we had planned. And uh, I asked the question, what is one thing in your life, if you removed it, would bring you closer to God? What is one simple thing that you enjoy doing that if you stopped doing it for one week, at the end of the week, you would be closer to God? Most of the people in the room all said the same thing, entertainment. If I stopped playing so many video games on my phone, if I stopped playing on Facebook so much, it'd be amazing. If I stopped surfing Pinterest, oh, Jesus, I will, revival may fall. And so I said at the end, why don't, we, why don't we just do something crazy and for one week remove those things that stand in the way. Remove those things that distract. Remove those things that make us lust. Remove those things that make us want. Remove those things that make us covet. Some people said TV. Some people said sports. I don't know about you, but one of the reasons in our house, and again, I'm not. this is not judgmental in any way, but we got rid of cable in our house for two reasons. Number one, there was a lot of filth that was just eat, coming in, and I couldn't stop it because it was on commercials. We could be watching a clean TV show for kids, and next thing you know, lingerie commercials are on. So I said, we're done. We just do Internet TV. No commercials. But the other thing, the other reason is because we, I kept seeing all these commercials about stuff I couldn't afford. I kept watching commercials about cars I couldn't afford. I kept watching commercials about motorcycles I couldn't buy. I kept watching commercials about clothes, and I'd look, and i go, man, those look good. I can't, I can't buy that. I can't fit in it either. <laughs> I'm just telling you. And one of the reasons I got rid of it, one of the reasons I transitioned, because I realized that my desires for things of the flesh, my desires for the things that come natural, were overshadowing the desires that God has for me. And I recognize that it all starts here. See, commandments 9 and 10, the ones that sum everything up about being honest with others and being honest with yourself, the reality of not, not lusting and desiring for things that aren't yours by putting things into perspective and being thankful for what God has given you, it all sums up into these two words, core character. Commandments 9 and 10 are all about our core character. It's about who we are in the, when no one's lucky. The very core of our being. Let me wrap this up this morning. See, something interesting. Something interesting happens after the commandments are given. After 1 through 10 are, are laid out, something, something happens that many times we miss because we get through the Ten Commandments, and you've admitted to me before that you run through and you it just you kind of miss the story, you kind of miss what's happening because you just kind of run through things. See, something happens at the end of the Ten Commandments that really, really kind of brings it all together in an interesting way, and it happens in Exodus chapter twenty, verse eighteen. It says this: Now, when all the people saw the thunder, say saw. the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. Picture this. Up on the, up on the mountaintop, up on Mount Sinai, here is God meeting with Moses in the flesh. Here is God showing up with lightning and thunder and there's smoke on the mountain. And here's a group of people that have hidden away from God, that have, have been lost in Egypt, have been, been in slavery, who have lost their minds. A whole generation that has never known the power of God. Here they are standing on the mountain seeing what God is doing. This is the part that I think we miss. The people were afraid and tremble. Well, that's good. It's good to be afraid of God, right? Yeah, the, the Word of God teaches all throughout Scripture. Fear the Lord. It's a healthy fear, not, not a fear of I'm going to run away, but it's a healthy fear. Tremble in the presence of God. Those are all really good things. But here's the part that we miss. And they stood far off. They stood 
far off. See, people tend to run from that. They tend to run from from the things that are going to protect them. It makes no sense, but it's the reality of, of who we are as a people. People tend to run from the law. Friends, let me tell you about the Ten Commandments. God's law is meant to be ran to. God's law is not meant to be ran from. It's not meant to stand far off. It's meant to be ran to. It's meant to be ran to because it's meant to protect us. Let me show you another way of looking at it, especially if you're a man in the house, you're going to really gravitate towards this. Imagine if on this stage I had a box, and in that box is everything that you need to protect your family in a crisis situation. In this box, I've got food rations. I've got weapons. I've got guns. I've got, I've got a tent. I've got shelter. I've got stuff to purify water. I've got everything that you could possibly need to protect your family. And if in a moment's notice, crisis struck, which one of you would not run up and embrace this box that has everything you need to protect you? Everything that you need to provide, everything that you need to set you up for success. See, that's what the Ten Commandments are. Hey, could you turn that piano down for me? It's all about setting you up for success. It's all about protecting. It's all about taking the things that you need and liberating you from them, with them. See, the Ten Commandments are not to enslave us. They're to liberate us. They're to set us up for success. They're to give us everything that we need. They're to keep our thoughts grounded and our, and our eyes focused on what's truth. But see, so many times we're like the Israelites at the bottom of the mountain and we're standing far off. I know God wants me to do this and I know that God wants me to go here and I know that God wants me to to lay this at the foot of the cross. I know that God wants me to change this area of my life, but I'm going to stand far off. I know what the Ten Commandments, I know what the law says, but if I stand far off, I don't have to deal with it. Friends, I want to ask you two very honest and difficult questions this morning. First one is, what law are you avoiding? Which one of the laws are you avoiding? Maybe it's beyond the Ten Commandments. Maybe God has given you a conviction about something. You've justified it. You've you've avoided it. You've stood far off. But God has said, this is wrong for you. I don't want you to do this. This needs to change in your life. I need you to... I need you to listen to me, but instead we avoid it. The second thing I want to ask you is what part of your core character is in question today? What is it at your very core this morning that is in question? Maybe this morning you you struggle with lying. Maybe for you this morning you have created a soft a false perception of who you are. Friends, let me tell you who we lie to the most is the person in the mirror. The person we lie to the most is the one we look at every morning. And we convince ourselves that we're somebody we're not. Maybe this morning you're struggling with a false perception that you've created. Maybe this morning your heart is struggling with coveting. There's just a lack of contentment. There's a lack of thankfulness. There's this constant desire to have what is not yours. See, these two issues deal with the very core of who we are as men and women, as husbands, as fathers, as moms, as dads, as followers of Christ. It has to do with our very core. So what part of your core character needs some work today? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm done. Maybe your very core is missing out on Jesus today. All across this room is eyes and ears of individuals that have been here for a long time, as well as people that are pretty new. This morning, I I just want to ask you, do you know Jesus today? Have you made a decision to follow him? Have you given your life to Christ? 
Have you backslid? Have you turned your back on him? See, your past is irrelevant right now. What's important is this moment and where you're headed. See, we believe at First Assembly that, that God gives us a fresh start when we give him our, our lives. So this morning, right where you're at, I just want to simply ask you, if you'd like to give your heart to Christ today and make a fresh start with him, could you just simply lift up your hands? doesn't mean you lift up a hand. It doesn't mean you join the church. Yeah, I see your hand, buddy. Who else? Who else would say, Pastor, that's me? I see your hand over there. Who else? Pastor, today I want to give my heart to Christ. Today I want to make a fresh start with him. Can we pray that prayer together today? Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. Help me to make a fresh start. To trust you with my life. You are Lord. And you are King. Over me and everything. Today I give you my life. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you another question. I just want to ask it in a very simple way. But if you feel the Holy Spirit dealing with your heart on, on any of the issues we talked about today, I want you to make a faith response. What does that mean? It means I want you to I want you to do something with it. Not just sit back and think about it. I want you to do something with it. This morning, I'm going to ask you just to do something little. See, the big thing is, is we need to change some areas of our lives, every one of us. But this morning, if, if you feel the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart in one of these areas that we talked about today, just lift your hand up and just put it up. Just hold it up. Come on. All over the place. Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Oh, good. Come on. Come on. All right. Pastor, why is my hand up? Am I, am I asking a question? No, it, you're surrendering. It's, a, it's symbolic of I'm surrendering. Just like when a child comes up and puts his hands up. And says, hold me. They're surrendering themselves. They're no longer in control. They're in your control. And in the same way this morning, we're symbolically saying, I surrender my core character to you, Father. And today I pray that you would stir every one of us. That you would protect our minds from the lies that we tell ourselves. That you would provoke and stretch us. That you would do what only you can. That you would challenge us this morning. That, God, when we walk out of this place, that we would, we would learn to be thankful for what you've given us and not to long for what is not ours. That we would create the very reality. We would live in the reality that, that, that you've given us. That we would grow where we're planted. That we would become the men and women of God that you've created us to be. Nothing more, nothing less. Father, today I pray that you would just stir and provoke us. God, I pray that you would challenge us to be honest with those around us as well as ourselves, that we would be the most honest with us. When we look in the mirror, that we would, we would deal with the things that are there. Father, and that we would, we would honor those that you have blessed and we would respect and be thankful for the way you've blessed us. Father, today I thank you for what you've done in this place and the lives that have been changed, the way you've provoked, the way you've encouraged, the way you've stretched us. God, I thank you that we were able to come together and worship you today, that we don't have to, we don't have to hide in a back room and, and fear, but we can come and we can declare that, God, you truly are worthy of the praise and you truly are, uh, you can have all of us. God, that our, our, our time together today has been incense to your throne, that our praise and our, our declaration, our shout, God, it's been praise to your throne. Father, today we give you the glory. Today we give you the honor, and for the rest of our lives, it's in Jesus' mighty, his holy and perfect name we pray, amen and amen. Can you just thank him this morning for what all he's done?